Hello and welcome to The Conscious Capitalists, hosted by two of the co-founders of the Conscious Capitalism Movement and co-authors of the Conscious Capitalism Field Guide from Harvard Business Press, Raj Sisodia and Timothy Henry. Each week, this podcast covers current events and business news and Raj and Timothy's latest thinking on what it takes to build a conscious business. For more information and notes from the show, go to www.theconsciouscapitalists.com. And now, Raj and Timothy. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 13 of The Conscious Capitalists with myself, Timothy Henry, and my partner in arms and for making the world a better place for business, Raj Sisodia. Hi, Raj. Hi, Timothy. Good to be with you again. And I can't believe it's 13th episode already, the lucky 13th. I know. We were trying to wonder, should we rename it 14 and skip 13 like some of the elevators do? I don't know. Oh. Well, Beyond those dilemmas, today we have um, a special guest with us, Ed Freeman. We'll do a more formal introduction in a moment. But Ed, besides being known as the father of stakeholder theory, is also the author of a new book called The Power of And, Responsible Business Without Trade-Offs. And that'll be the core of what we talk about today. So Raj, maybe start with an introduction of an old friend of ours. Yes, it really is a pleasure to have you on, Ed. Uh, you've been a, an intellectual and a personal hero for many of us uh, in the conscious capitalism movement for a very long time. And I'm going to ask you to share a little bit of your journey with us uh, shortly. But currently, Ed is the uh, uh, Ellis and Signe Olsen Professor of Business Administration, as well as a university professor at the uh, Darden School, University of Virginia. Now that's, for those of you who are not familiar with academia, that is about the top rung. There's, there's no place <laughs> beyond that is heaven, I think. <laughs> University professor. So, I mean, he is just one of the most respected and eminent uh, scholars uh, in any discipline uh, in the world. And uh, he's also uh, been a professor of religious ethics at, uh, at the University of Virginia among many other things. He has numerous uh, visiting appointments. He's got numerous honorary doctorates um, and um, considered widely the father of stakeholder management as an approach. And that really was dating back to the 70s when he started writing about this subject uh, at a time when uh, the shareholder dogma was taking root. Uh, when Milton Friedman and, uh, and then you had, of course, uh, Jensen and Meckling and others who were really formulating all the theories around that, Ed was a voice of reason in the wilderness talking about stakeholders. And his groundbreaking book was uh, Strategic Management, a Stakeholder Approach, uh, which was published in 1984. Uh, my introduction to Ed really happened uh, in the uh, early 2000s when I was working on Firms of Endearment. And my co-author, David Wolf, uh, kept referring to Ed's work. And then I started uh, reading into it. And I said, wow, yeah, this is what we are talking about. So, and then we, of course, got to meet Ed. And he came to our first Conscious Capitalism Conference. So it's just been a delight. And for those who don't know Ed at a human level, in addition to being a world-class scholar and author and speaker, he's also a gourmet chef. Uh, he's a black belt uh, martial artist. Uh, and he's a highly accomplished musician who has written dozens, if not a hundred or more songs in two different genres and recorded uh, uh, music. Uh, you know, he's got a studio in his home in Charlottesville where we have enjoyed many uh, a lovely evenings. So welcome Ed uh, to this uh, podcast and we really look forward to our chat today. Thanks Raj and thanks Timothy. It's really good to be here uh, with the two of you. Yeah, so if you could start and just tell us uh, about your journey, uh, it's quite fascinating, you know, how we end up where we are and how you ended up uh, in the world of business schools. Well, it was, it was mostly uh, luck um, and being at the right place at the right time. There was no plan. I mean, I was getting PhD in philosophy uh, and there were, as usual, no jobs in philosophy. Um, and one of the people on my committee says, what are you going to do next year? And I said, I, you know, I don't know. I was maybe... 22, maybe 23. I don't, I don't uh, remember quite. And uh, he said, well, you should do postdoc. And I said, postdoc, great. I knew that that paid. I had grown up pretty poor uh, in rural Georgia. And I said, where? And he said, well, you know, uh, Wharton. And because uh, you're interested in this decision making stuff. And I had never heard of Wharton. I didn't know what it was or where it was. And so I said, well, what's Wharton? And he said, it's a business school. 
And I went, oh, you know, is it a good one? And he said, well, it's one of the best. And I said, well, where is it? <laughs> and he said, University of Pennsylvania, Philadelphia. And I said, well, I might be interested because my girlfriend uh, was going to Penn uh, in city planning. And so I trucked off to Philadelphia, uh, get interviewed for this postdoc position at Wharton, get the position. Uh, and I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing. No idea. Uh, the girlfriend thing worked out. Maureen and I have been married for 43 years. And so that, that part of it worked out just well. Uh, and I was trying to figure out what is this business thing? Well, you know, even as a, a kind of poor kid from rural Georgia, uh, we knew you had to deal with the people who could affect you and that you could affect. That seemed to me to be life 101. Um, and in the air at Wharton at the time, at this research center run by Russell Acoff and Jim Emsoff and others, uh, the stakeholder idea was there. Uh, it was uh, an idea that Acoff had probably written more about than anybody else. Uh, and I, I just, you know, uh, tried to uh, say, well, what, what would business be like if we took this idea seriously? And it seemed like complete common sense to me. Uh, I, in fact, when I wrote that book in 84, 84 is 82. So I, I, I wrote it basically uh, summer, summer of 82. And uh, um, I, I, I had no idea anybody would find this interesting. I, I didn't think the stakeholder idea was the most interesting idea in the book. I, I didn't think uh, anybody would find it anything but completely banal and common sense, certainly not revolutionary, certainly not, uh, you know, and for the most part, uh, no one did because kind of no one read it. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, this whole book has something like uh, 40,000 citations now, and, uh, which is a lot for an academic. And, and uh, people said, oh, so what's it like to have written a business bestseller? And I tell them, I don't really know because they only printed 2,000 copies of the book. And we gave most of them away. So, you know, I, I was just kind of in the right place at the right time. I get way too much credit, as you've already illustrated. Uh, lots of people uh, like Russell Acoff and uh, Ian Mitroff and uh, my colleague Jim Emsoff and, uh, you know, lots of other people worked on this idea. They were really uh, the pioneers, uh, etc. cetera. I, I just wrote a book that tried to uh, put a bunch of stuff together as to how you'd run a company if you took this seriously. Uh, and about, you know, what did I know about running a com com company? Not much. Um, so right place, right time, very lucky. And what caught your attention after that? Because over the years, you've been sort of looked to as the icon in this area. And at what point did it start to become something for you? Well, it was always something, uh, in part because in 1977, I started working, uh, and my research group started working uh, with the telecom in the industry. I know, I know Raj has a history there as well, uh, with uh, the Bell companies. Um, and they had stakeholder problems out the wazoo. They were trying to do rate cases. They were so efficient that State Utilities Commission uh, were making them do the uh, uh, efficiencies that they needed without giving them the rate relief. Uh, we had put together a seminar for them that brought real live stakeholders in to train their executives to think about that. So for five years, I basically uh, was a consultant to other companies as well, but mostly uh, to companies in telecom. Uh, helping them figure out uh, how to deal with stakeholders. Uh, so I knew this was uh, important. Uh, but like I said earlier, I've been pretty much a one trick pony. I mean, I've, I've kind of written the same thing lots of different times and lots of different ways and lots of different connections. But I still think it's an incredibly common sense idea. Uh, and it's hard to see. <laughs> It's hard to see how you can think about it differently. Yeah. I mean, 
look, even if all you care about is shareholder value, if that's all you care about, how are you going to do it? Mm. You're going to have great products and services. Customers want to buy. Suppliers want to make you better. Employees who are engaged. Communities who want you there. If you do all that and you get kind of lucky, you know, you might make money. So, I, you know, yeah. I, I've, the world's come around in the last 43 years so that lots of people think this is an interesting idea now. Uh, in 1977, there weren't that many people who thought this was interesting. Well, what strikes you now about where, you know, there's now stakeholder capitalism? You know, it's not just stakeholder practice or theory. It's now stakeholder capitalism. What strikes you about this moment in time that people are now sort of, <laughs> you started with us in conscious capitalism. Now you got your own kind of capitalism, stakeholder capitalism. Well, I, I don't I don't think the, the label matters uh, so much here. Uh, we were at a meeting, Raj, I think you were, you were there. I know Kip Tyndall was there and Jeff Cherry at the White House that Tom, Tom Perez uh, ran about what's the right brand for this stuff. And all the people, uh, you know, who were the thought leaders in this stuff, uh, like Raj and Kip and others, you know, they were all there, people from Just Capital, people from Inclusive Capitalism, people who are, uh, uh, you know, impact investors and ESG investors. And, you know, there are 40 of these things. Uh, and I started to think, like, it doesn't matter what the final brand is. What matters is that there are four or five critical ideas that whatever the revision of what we call capitalism, what I just call business, whatever that revision is, it needs to deal with these four or five ideas like purpose and profits, stakeholders and shareholders, business as a societal institution, as well as a market institution, uh, people as fully human, as well as economic and putting ethics and business together. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm a big fan of conscious capitalism. I'm a big fan of inclusive capitalism. Uh, Jay Cohn's Imperative 21, uh, Just Capital, Impact Investing. I'm a fan of all those things. And uh, I think it will have impact if we don't get into the, you know, my version of doing this is better than your version of doing this. Yeah, absolutely. I Some of that. that's inevitable, but uh, I, I like to think of this as a big tent. And if you want to call it conscious capitalism, great. You want to call it stakeholder capitalism, great. You want to call it something else, I don't really care. It is worth interesting. It is interesting to know that the so-called father of capitalism, Adam Smith, never used the word. Mm. Uh, you know, where did we get the word capitalism? Well, it, it came from Marx. And that's a, <laughs> that's, a, that's a lot like letting the enemy, you know, name your favorite football team. Uh, it's not going to work out. The Washington football team equivalent. Well, is that's what, what it's going to turn out to be, you know. So um, I like to think about capitalism has a lot of baggage uh, to it. Um, and you can spend endless arguments trying to sort out what it really is. Um, I'm really interested in how business works. Mm. Um, you know, and I think it works best when there's uh, – in a free society where there's uh, property rights and voluntary exchange and uh, people take responsibility for what they do. Um, Adam Smith thought the same thing. I love that. And um, in your new book, The Power of And, uh, you go into great detail on those five. You've got a, a chapter on each one. You set it up and you frame it really well. And then each one has a, a chapter where you go into a little more detail with examples and, uh, and explaining it in more depth. And, you know, as you think about those five and, um, you know, I know this is difficult because sometimes, you know, we, we all have children and, you know, which is your favorite child. But if you were going to advise uh, somebody who's beginning on this journey of the five different areas that you spoke about, about purpose, about stakeholders, about business and society, about the humanness of people and business, and, and then the fifth about uh, the ethics and, and values that are important. Where do you sort of begin that discussion with someone who's coming to you and say, Ed, help me, where do I start? 
Well, I, I, I mean, I don't think there's one magical place. I mean, the, the fool's errand that most academics make is to find the one and only one way of doing things for all businesses at all times in all situations under any circumstances. Uh, business is what we philosophers would call um, a family resemblance idea. Uh, we kind of know what they are, but we couldn't define uh, something that's conscious of all of them, that, that's true of all of them. Uh, so uh, business businesses has this you know, incredible amount of variation. A lot of companies, uh, if they've lost their sense of purpose, they'll start with that. Um, a lot of entrepreneurs have a sense of pur purpose, but they labor under this old story that it's all about the money. Uh, so uh, in that case, you'd, you'd probably start with the, uh, if, it's a, if it's a small business as well, you'd start with getting them to understand who their stakeholders are and how those stakeholders are interdependent and how you, you can escape this idea that economists just love, that there's always a trade-off. Um, and so, you know, it, 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 really, it, really it really depends. I, I tend to favor, because there's so many misconceptions about purpose, people think they have it if they can write it down. But, you know, purpose lives in the systems in the processes, uh, it, it doesn't live on the mouse pads and the uh, cross stitch statement on the wall. Mm. Uh, and you really have to take apart, especially if you're a big co co company, you have to take apart those systems and processes that were probably aimed at making as much money as you possibly can. Mm. Uh, and, and again, look at the effects of those processes, et cetera, on what you're trying to do with stakeholders. Um, the other place to start uh, is sort of within those by, by trying to get people to understand that you have relationships with stakeholders. It's not a set of transactions. And many companies still see, well, there's this transaction and then tomorrow there'll be another one and the next day there'll be another one. And seeing the world in transactional terms is very different than seeing it in relational terms. Hmm. Uh, the example I love is if I were to go next door now where my wife Maureen is working and I said, uh, you know, baby, I, I've been thinking about these last 43 years and I think you're up three. I think you owe me three. I, I'm pretty sure I know what the outcome of that would be, and it wouldn't be pretty. Uh, she's a second-degree black belt in Taekwondo, mm -hmm. and uh, that wouldn't be good for me. Why? Well, in relationships, there's a presumption it's going to continue, and you don't keep score. Mm -hmm. You know, you know. Sometimes you have to step back and say, "Wait a minute, this isn't working. We need to renegotiate the terms." Or in the relationship, of course, that happens, but you don't keep score every day. And if you have to keep store every day, that's not really a very good relationship. Uh, we know this in our personal lives. Uh, it seems eminently true in business as well. I love that, Ed. And I, what I like about that is that relational element brings up a, an interesting angle as well, which is at the core of many relationships is trust, including our personal relationships, but particularly our business relationships. I trust that you're going to watch out for my interest. I trust yeah. that if I compromise today, you'll compromise tomorrow. And at some point, this will feel equal and or at least balanced in some kind of way. And, and I'm curious, you know, um, that idea of trust in relationships, how do you think that applies to this idea? Of well, it's Look, it's complicated. Uh, as a as a society, we have not much trust in business. Now, if you if you ask people as an institution, yet if you ask people, uh, do you trust the businesses that you know very well that you that you do business with? Trust is higher, uh, and so it's a it's a curious thing that we have this this idea of business as this sort of uh, you know, drunk uncle relative uh, that's pretty much immoral most of the time, 
uh, that we talk about in kind of hushed tones uh, and we wish we didn't have to. Uh, and, you know, teaching business ethics, which I do, must be a short course, oxymoron, contradiction. You know, I didn't know business had any theoretical subject. I've heard most of them. Uh, so there's low trust in business, low trust in big business, uh, high trust in small, higher trust in smaller biz, biz, business. But it's really a, 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 a one at a time, one stakeholder at a time idea. Uh, my take on the companies that Raj and his co-authors talked about in terms of endearment is these were companies that built trust uh, with pretty much every uh, interaction uh, with with their stakeholders. Uh, I'll, I'll never forget uh, Jim Burke, who was the CEO of Johnson & Johnson when the extra strength Tylenol uh, poisoning happened and eight people were killed through no fault of John, Johnson & Johnson. Uh, Burke took Tylenol off the market, $500 million off the bottom line. And when he was able to reintroduce it, uh, he talked about you know, he got a lot of credit, but the real heroes here were the everyday people at J&J &J who built trust with customers and suppliers and others uh, every day in what they did. Uh, and, and I think that's something that you don't hear much about from people who argue that we need to pay more attention to shareholders. So add this idea of uh, uh, shareholder value maximization. You know, which uh, I think is, I say it's probably one of the most harmful and dangerous ideas, uh, damaging ideas that we've ever had, because it has hurt pretty much everybody. It has hurt employees, definitely. If you look at worker pay, you know, they're just a cost to be minimized. I think it has hurt customers because we're trying to maximize sales and do whatever we need to do to convert them into customers and keep them as customers. It has hurt the environment. It has hurt communities which have been abandoned in the pursuit of higher shareholder value. So it's hurt everybody, including shareholders. So there are lots of data at the aggregate level that since the 1970s, overall performance has actually gone down. Mm -hmm. And I think it has been the single factor, biggest factor in damaging capitalism itself, because that language doesn't inspire anybody. That language actually puts you, you know, in the category of somebody who's greedy and exploitative and, uh, and so forth. So I think, and I do remember distinctly a few years ago, we were at Fordham University uh, at some conference and Michael Jensen was there and you and he both spoke back to back and he basically stood up and apologized uh, for his life's work. He said agency theory has done more harm. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea that managers should act as agents on behalf of shareholders. That idea has done more harm than any other idea you know, that, uh, that we've come up with. So I think this whole debate, we can frame it as this is proactively good for all of our stakeholders, of course. But on the other side, that other idea has been so harmful and has hurt everybody connected with business. Well, I think that's, uh, that's mostly right, uh, Raj. I don't think it's hurt everybody because there's some companies that haven't managed to pull off maximizing shareholder value and trade-offs. Uh, but for the most part, I think you're right. Uh, I've become friends with Mike uh, Jensen over, over the years. Uh, and of course, he has devoted the rest of his life to thinking about uh, integrity. Now, he has a particular stylized way to think about that. But he, he, I think what he would say now is that if you do agency theory without a sense of integrity, you're going to do harm. Uh, he's also written about uh, the importance of uh, listening to stakeholders uh, and people who want to talk about that. Uh, my colleague, uh, Bobby Parmar, has uh, done a film uh, with uh, uh, documentarian Paul Wagner. Uh, you know, you were in the, uh, you're, you're in the film. <laughs> and uh, they spent a long time with Michael Jen Jensen. And he says, uh, like at that Fordham conference, he says, look, people make mistakes. Bill and I did. Uh, and that's a fairly resounding, you know, uh, admission uh, from, uh, you, you know, he says, you know, that stop thinking that you got to maximize the stock price. Well, the problem, you know, after the global financial crisis, 
many finance uh, professors said, well, you know, wait, 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 we didn't, we didn't mean maximize short-term share price. We, we meant maximize long-term shareholder value. And my response to that is, wait a minute, I, I'm not a positivist. I, I, don't, I don't believe in this idea uh, that, you know, the empirical analysis of the world is all that's real. I said, but most of you are. And, and, and the only thing that's observable is short-term shareholder price. I mean, the, the problem here actually is this distinction between short-term and long-term. For so many years, and I, I know uh, you two have heard the same thing, people have said, Ed, this stakeholder stuff makes sense in the long term. It doesn't make sense in the short term. But this Ed, this ethics stuff makes sense in the, in the long term, not in the short term. Well, now, wait a minute. Let's, let's, be, let's, let's apply some logic here. Short term doesn't make sense. Long term, it does. Well, the long term moves. The long term moves. It never gets to the long term because, of course, we live life in the short term. Life exists in the short term, in the now. And so we often use this short term, long term distinction as a way of uh, really saying, I don't think this stuff works. You know, what I want people to do is figure out how to create value for stakeholders now and then keep it up. I mean, that's, that's, that's what you have to do. Uh, I mean, it might take some time to figure it out the right way, but you're trying to f figure out, you know, uh, how to do this in the short term. I, I think it's because I'm just older that, you know, I distrust this, this distinction. You know, what do you want to be in 10 years? My answer to that is very simple, alive and breathing, you know? So uh, I, I'm really distrustful of this idea of long-term value uh, because it's hard to make sense of, of, of what that really is. Well, that's a really important distinction that you're making there, Ed. And um, I agree with you on one level and on another level, I'm curious. And the curious part of me is coming at this from the point of view of, let's say today you're an organization that does have a short-term focus and you are focused on that short-term shareholder maximization. Well, but hang on. Yeah. It's not that you're focused on the short-term that's the problem. It's that you're focused on the wrong thing in the short-term. And that's the thing most people don't get. Look, you can be as short-term as you, as you want it. Uh, I love all my kids. And I try to show them that in the, you know, today. Mm -hmm. Uh, I try to focus on the right things in the short term. Yeah. Uh, and when you focus on the wrong things in the short term, which many businesses have done, yeah. then it's going to be hard to change. Yeah. Yeah. And so pulling on that out, pull that out a little bit more. I mean, so you're an organization and you have been on the wrong side of that, uh, that ledger. You've been on the, the shareholder, the share price focus in the short term. Um, it's not like you press a switch and you suddenly are on the other side of like, I've got this brand new set of metrics that we're gonna put out and we're gonna suddenly be more focused on stakeholders and de facto change our perspective on what this business is about. So I'm curious, where do businesses start that journey from the, okay, I don't wanna be short-term focused anymore, but I'm a CEO and oh, by the way, I'm only in this role for three or four years. <laughs> well, again, that's why I would say you do want to be short term focused. You mm -hmm. just want to focus on the right things in the short term. So rather than focusing on uh, stock price, you might focus on what leads to higher stock prices uh, that that's sustainable. Look, the way to have a great long term is have a great short term and keep it up. Right. That's yep. that's that's it. So ultimately, that's why I think the short term, long term distinction is not very useful here. I mm -hmm. think we misuse it, especially when we say, OK, well, let's switch to a long term orientation. A lot of people see that as an excuse for inefficiency. Yeah. Yeah, I got that. And I guess it in a part comes to the to the board. So I want to go to the board level now and sort of say, you know, you, you do make a great case in your book about the history of, you know, what's happened over the last 40 years and where boards have gone. 
And that, frankly, from a legal point of view, they don't have to focus on the shareholder and that financial fiduciary responsibility. In fact, Leo Stern, who's just stepped down from being the uh, chief justice of the Delaware court, himself has written in a number of articles in the Harvard Law Review um, a series that they've put out on this, that he thinks that's a dumb idea and they don't have to do that. They really do need to be focused on a different set of things. Yeah. And yet we've got that, we've got that thinking. Um, how do we change it? And, and, and why did we get into that place where that became the excuse the boards used for, for not doing anything? Yeah, I don't really know the, how we got into that. It's a long history back to Burley and Dodd in the 20s and 30s. You know, Milton Friedman wrote this famous uh, paper that's now the 50th anniversary of uh, this month. Uh, that the only uh, obligation is to maximize profits for shareholders. Uh, Lynn Stout, the late Lynn Stout, law professor at Cornell, uh, I think uh, um, kind of undid that logic in which she said, look, that's not the law. That the, and she goes through it case by case. The cases used to, to look at that Revlon in the 80s, Ford v. Dodge back uh, a long time, time ago, don't, that's not what those K cases are about, and they don't have any precedent uh, here. Um, and, uh, you know, directors take things like their Revlon duties, which is if your company's up for sale uh, from and going uh, through a change of control from public to private, that's what the Revlon case is, you have to, uh, you know, you have to give it to the highest bidder. Mm. Uh, but that's, those are very rare K, K cases uh, where that's there. Uh, I think it's just the, um, you know, it's the weight that we give to, uh, it's, it's the old story. It's the idea that business is about the money. Uh, and that's what's doing the damage uh, here. It's doing damage to directors. Directors have a duty of care uh, to, take care of the interests of the corporation and, uh, you know, to manage the affairs of the corporation. And the corporation is usually defined in a charter with its field of activities. In most charters, it says that to be engaged in any legal business. Uh, and courts have held again and again and again that taking stakeholder interest into account is okay. Um, there's some states in which you have to do that. There are some jurisdictions in the world uh, in which the Companies Act in, in, in the UK is one and uh, another similar thing in Denmark and uh, of course joint governance in Germany, et cetera. There are lots of ways to do this, to take stakeholder interest into account at the board level. Mm. Ultimately, what the board does matters, but what matters more is how people in the company actually manage the relationships that you're enmeshed in. Uh, and the board's job is not to screw that up. Um, I just did a short essay, which I, I hope is coming out in directors and boards um, on why Friedman's not appropriate anymore. Look, the world's just too complicated and it's impossible to deny today uh, the effects of a business on a community, as, as Raj said, or uh, the effects of a business uh, on its employees or its uh, suppliers or its other stakeholders, including its shareholders. Uh, and so because that technology makes the news cycle 24 seven, 365, because there's nowhere to hide your effects on the rest of the stakeholders in your business is absolutely uh, you're in the fishbowl. It's absolutely there in public view. So stakeholder capitalism, if, if you like those phrase or conscious capitalism, is the result. Uh, we're racing towards trying to do that, uh, you know, complete with the mistakes that we'll make, et cetera. Well, I'm fascinated by your mentioning of the Company Act over in the UK. So I'm based in London these days, and I'm part of a... Uh, a not-for-profit uh, sort of think tank called Regenerate. And our purpose is to make the UK the best place in the world for purpose-driven businesses. 
And it's been fascinating because part of our preliminary research that the think tank part has been doing has said that despite the company act, um, there's very few companies that are actually behaving that way. So the option is there from a legal point of view, and yet they're not stepping into actually doing well, that. <laughs> okay, so, so the other thing I would say about that is you gotta be careful because we're in the grip of the old story. Mm. You know, we're in the grip of the old story in which uh, we want to see what goes on. I mean, look, we, we engage in this kind of thinking that uh, we call in the book saints and sinners th thinking. You know, uh, most businesses are sinners. Uh, they're really kind of morally questionable. They only care about the money. There are a few saints. And when these saints lift their head up uh, and then they do something wrong, you know, or they say something controversial, like some of our well-known friends in conscious capitalism often do. Uh, no idea what you're they talking about, Ed. Then they become sinners. You know, people go, oh, they're really just, uh, they're really just in it for the money. Hmm. I don't know any, any uh, saints, you know, sorry. I just don't. Uh, and I don't know many people who are complete sinners all the time, aside from some politicians. And, uh, and that's a nonpartisan state statement for me. But, you know, we got to stop this. Uh, and, and people who, who do what we do, teach in business schools and teach about this stuff, are the worst at it. We find our favorite com companies. Uh, we canonize them. Uh, and we, we find our favorite uh, uh, sort of whipping boys and we, and we beat up on them. Oscar Wilde said it better. Uh, every saint's got a past, every sinner's got a future. Hmm. Uh, we need to see business in completely human terms. Uh, if I were to say to you, Timothy, Raj, uh, I know this company and they have a real ethics issue. Now you might be exceptions, but I'll bet absolutely no one listening to the podcast thinks, oh, they've invented something really cool that makes our lives better. Generally, we see ethics as something bad has happened or somebody's been harmed. But if business is going to get credit for the bad stuff, and it deserves that, it ought to get credit for the good stuff as well. Mm. Saints and sinners thinking kind of prevents that sort of common sense, uh, you know, view. Mm. Uh, this is how we raise our children. We don't raise our children to be saints or s sinners. If we raise them to be saints, we're going to be incredibly disappointed. <laughs> uh, and if we raise them to be sinners, uh, well, we're a little messed up. <laughs> so, you know, uh, applying some good old fashioned common sense humanity, uh, I think matters here. I think the phrase uh, I like is that bad ideas are much more powerful than bad people. And we have been enthralled to a lot of bad ideas. I think in business and capitalism and in society yeah. generally. And I think all of us are engaged in this uh, uh, quest to bring about better ideas. And I think you'd call, you call it a new story for business. Right? I think that is really the framing. Uh, what about the language Ed, that I've seen, for example, HEB, the biggest grocery chain in, uh, in Texas, a really wonderful company uh, started by the grandmother of the current CEO. And their mantra is, the CEO tells all the people, we need to pay our people as much as possible. Uh, mm -hmm. Speaking about employees, right? And yeah. they actually have far better wages and benefits than Walmart, even though their prices are, are lower than Walmart, right? So this language of doing as much as possible for each of our stakeholders without getting into the maximization, because maximization now means you're going to trade off others, right? So we can only ma maximize one at a time. You can't ma right. maximize over five. Right. So we say we're going to do as much as possible for our employees, as much as possible for our customers, right? Uh, and and break those trade-offs and, and look for those uh, those uh, synergies wherever we can find them. And yeah, I, I would rewrite uh, the Milton Friedman piece, which I I offered to do, but uh, the Times didn't uh, didn't manage to want to want want that. Um, and that's a little tricky because I think people on the left need business as a whipping boy and people on the right need business to stay uh, seen as immoral. 
as questionable and about the money. Uh, and so uh, I think both sides of the political debate are, uh, at, uh, are at fault here. Um, I, my rewrite of Free, Friedman is as follows. The only responsibility of the executive is to create as much value for stakeholders as possible without resorting to trade-offs. Um, everybody matters and everybody needs to win. If anybody is losing in our stakeholder system, then we're not there, right? We haven't found. Look, uh, I've always said, I, I think the right way to understand bad companies supposedly like tobacco is, uh, look, until you give me the pleasure of smoking without the health risk, you have a lousy product because lousy, lousy products are what kills pe pe people. And so fix your lousy product. Well, I'm going to go out on a limb here. I'm going to go out on a limb here because Philip Morris, bad boy that it has been seen in the press, has stated that their purpose is to lead to a, a, um, a tobacco-free, a smoke-free world. And they've now invested heavily in moving exactly into that with nicotine products that don't burn, so there's no smoke. And, you know, the notion being that the cancerogens come from the smoke, not necessarily from they the do. nicotine. And they're now at a place where 19% of their revenue last year came from these smokeless products. Yeah. And they've been really good about saying, here's our purpose. Here's how we're going to measure it. Here's how we're going to interact with the stakeholders around this, the health officials, the smokers, the regulators. Um, and as much as we've beaten up on tobacco companies, they're a really interesting example. Of well, I think they deserve to be side. beaten up on uh, when we did. And they, like I said, they deserve a, a chance to show us they mean to change. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I think they're legitimately uh, trying to do that. So tell me a little bit about, you know, there's uh, this whole push right now for ESG. Yeah. And how, what lens do you look at the ESG movement through, um, given your history and background? Well, there's impact investing and ESG and that sort of stuff. And uh, what is it? The principles for responsible investing, which say mm -hmm. you got to pay attention to ESG. And banks have something like uh, the last number I saw, Raj, you might know better, nine trillion dollars under management. Uh, uh, that have signed these principles. Um, you know, I, I, great, let a thousand flowers bloom here. Um, it's a little bit like, I mean, it's, it's a little, I find it a little bit ironic. A lot of the finance and accounting people, which have been very much in the grip of sh the shareholder value story, are now you know, they're, they're, the, they're, the, they're the biggest cheerleaders for ESG, et cetera. And, and they act a little bit like, I mean, this is part of the academic world. They act a little bit like this is their new toy. Mm -hmm. Look, people have worked on how, how you understand other than economic value uh, since at least the 1950s. Yeah. And so, you know, I don't, uh, what I find new here is that a bunch of people who are pretty hostile to the idea uh, have discovered it. Yeah. You yeah. know, just like people in strategy sort of discovered the stakeholder idea sometime in the late nineties, <laughs> you know, and it was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, great. We've been talking about this for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's really interesting. I mean, ESG right now, Obviously, one of the big critiques of it is that the, there's no clear set of standards and the numbers are moving yeah, all over the place. But I'm curious in particular, because around the S, one of the things that people are pushing is stakeholders. And well, look, I, I don't buy this argument that we can't measure this stuff, you know? And one of the reasons is, hey, we, we put a person on the moon and brought them back. That was a hard problem, you know, uh, measuring how, what value you create for a community kind of pales beside bringing somebody back from the moon mm. uh, to me. Uh, and plus, 
There are lots of ways to measure how you're creating value for stakeholders. Every company does it. Every company me 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 measures. Uh, Roger, the marketing guy, you know this, measures how it creates value for its customers. Many of them with uh, uh, sophisticated supply chains measure this ar across the supply chain. Uh, what we don't have is one set of measurements that works for all companies at all times and all circumstances throughout the galaxy. Uh, and I, once again, I think that's a fool's errand. Mm. What we could have, what we could have, I've proposed this and no one's taken me up on it, uh, probably, thank goodness, uh, we can have stake options. So we figure out how to measure the value that we're creating uh, for customers, suppliers, employees, communities, people with money. Some of, the, some of those measures might be perceptual me me measures, but by the way, that's what stock price is. It's a perceptual me measure of the analyst uh, and the traders. Uh, and then you could trade, you could do some math, uh, and then you could uh, trade, you could trade these stake options. And I, I, I you know, I'm going to sell you short. I'm going to sell your 90s, your <laughs> stakeholder nine, your stake nine, 90s short, because I don't think you're going to meet your community satisfaction n n number. Yeah. Now, I know that people in Las Vegas will trade these things. My, my son was a professional poker player for a while and, and folks there will bet on anything. Uh, but if you think about it, if this really is how you think um, companies ought to be run in the interest of its stakeholders, so says the business roundtable and, and, and others, stake options, right away solve executive compensation issues. You, you pay people based on stake op options. The other thing stake options do is it gives you feedback from uh, uh, an options market as to how you're doing and what the future look, looks like. Uh, and, and that's extremely valuable uh, for you because if you wait for the stock price you wait for the stock price to get feedback. In the words of my martial arts instructor, when watching me punch or kick, too late. Mm. <laughs> right? It's too late. Yeah. You want this. You want this feedback as early as possible, and that's what option markets give you. Except that the current ones uh, don't give you very, very good data on on things. Yeah. Doesn't that create the problem that, in fact, profit's a lagging indicator? And what you're talking about is what are those leading indicators that are going to be telling us that the things that are creating that profit are moving in the right direction? Yeah, look, profit's an outcome. Uh, it's an outcome of, of how you deal with your other, your other state, stakeholders. You don't, you don't get a penny of pro profits from shareholders. You get profits because of how you manage customers, suppliers, employees, and communities via their regulation, et cetera, et cetera, re reputation, et cetera. Uh, it's, like, it's like happiness. Happiness, if you try to maximize happiness, you'll be one of the most miserable people on the face of the earth, right? Happiness is a function of, of uh, uh, who you love, of the relationships that you have. It's a function of what you're doing with your life. Uh, it's not something you can just try to try to do and have it work. But Aristotle knew this. He, he wrote about, about, about this. But, you know, uh, getting straight, what are, what, are, what are things that are outcomes? Uh, and then if I want to do something about it, I do something about the things that lead to the outcomes. Uh, and again, that's one of the reasons the stakeholder idea has always seemed eminently common sense to me. So, Ed, you mentioned compensation and, um, you know, the compensation question gets complicated pretty quick. I love in your book, you point out that, you know, the, for example, the CEO pay versus the median, median payment of uh, an employee has gotten way out of control over the last 30 years. Um, and a lot of that comp system has been based on an easy measure, stock price. So, 
where do we go? I mean, you, you know, you talk about the stock option, the stake options, but, but I'm wondering if I'm on a comp committee of a board, you know, what, what do we do in the short term to, to one, either address the ethical issue of that discrepancy and then two, reorient the comp system so that it's focused on the means of production rather than the, the outcome? Well, I think one of the first things we do is we stop listening to consultants whose job it is, is to run up CEO pay. Uh, there are a number of those. Uh, it's a great gig if you can get it, uh, but they've done a lot of harm. Um, the second thing we need to do is to be sure we're in touch with the people uh, somehow uh, who are making uh, $7 an hour or $12 an hour or whatever that is that we haven't sort of forgotten about them. Uh, one of our friends in Conscious Cat Capitalism, you both know Tom Gardner at The Motley Fool often says, look, raise the, raise the salary of the lowest 10, 10% in your company. You'd be amazed at how much good you will do, how much goodwill you'll create, uh, et, et cetera. Another one of our friends in Conscious Capitalism, Kip Tindall, uh, you know, would say, look, we're going to, we're going to, we pay twice the uh, retail a average that we did at the container store. That's how you get great people. And so you have to, you have to think about, you have to think about that. Uh, if you contrast the business models of a Starbucks uh, who would pay people to, uh, uh, you know, help people with their college uh, and until recently, you know, that was not something that McDonald's did. They, 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 their business model was very di different and they had to figure out how to, how to, how to change it. Uh, because, you know, you, you, you're having a hard time getting people to, to work there. Um, and so I, I think that, that makes uh, a lot of sense to, to have the board ask the question, are we paying people? Uh, as, 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 as well as we could, uh, if they're not engaged in the work, uh, it's not going to hurt anything to, to pay them more. You might, you might get some engage, engagement, but we know people don't engage for the money. Uh, they engage because uh, they believe in some cause. They believe in, in the purpose, uh, et cetera. Uh, but up to a certain point, uh, and some people will argue that's about seventy thousand uh, dollars. You got to be able to take care of your family uh, and, and stuff. So, Ed, I was also curious about COVID and uh, the, these unusual times that we're in right now, where um, some people are arguing more than ever we need to be focused on stakeholders and we need to be shifting, and others are saying, "Forget that. We just need to get back to normal." Um, what do you think the effect is going to be of, of this? strange period of the virus that we're going through. Well, I'm not, I'm just, I'm distrustful of people who say we got to get back to normal. Uh, you mean the normal uh, world in which many people don't have any hope or, or do you mean some other nor normal world? Um, look, I, I, if you think about COVID and you think about global warming and you think about how people are unengaged in the business, and you think about inequality, and you think about the implicit and explicit racism that exists in the world. We are not going to solve those problems by refocusing on shareholder value. It's just not going to happen. If we make progress in making the world a better place due to those challenges, it'll be because business plays a part in figuring out how to create product services and institutions that make us better. So um, that, that's, that's what I'm, I'm very optimistic of that, mm. about, about, about that. I think we're already seeing it. If you go to the Just Capital website and look at how Just Capital is tracking what companies are doing. Now, these are established com companies to deal with the COVID crisis uh, is, is pretty amazing. It's not shareholder value stuff. Well, Ed, you're one of the uh, most uh, widely read and thoughtful people we know. And so are there any books you would recommend or what's on your mind nowadays? What are you thinking about uh, for our listeners? 
Well, I've been uh, spending a lot of my time uh, trying to promote this movie that uh, we're both in, uh, Fishing with Dynamite. Um, and uh, people in the uh, movie, um, people like uh, um, Arthur Brooks, who comes from a kind of right point of view, and uh, Bob Rice, who comes from kind of a lefty point of view, you know, agreeing uh, about uh, about these these issues. Um, and I've been doing a podcast of my own called the Stakeholder Podcast uh, with my son Ben, uh, and we're trying to do a, a sort of here's here's we need to get the stakeholder thinking to a much broader all audience, and we're trying to do it so it's not. Uh, you know, old business school hands like me, but with two generations. He's he's in his early thirties, uh, and we're trying to have guests. Uh, you've been on one, uh, Raj, uh, and we're having lots of people on uh, for that. So I've been doing that a lot, um, trying trying to write two or three books as usual. Love it. Well, Ed, thank you so much for your generosity of time and thought today. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks. Nice, nice, nice to be with both of you again. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. Really great. Great being with you. Thank you. Good. Thank you. And thank you all for our listeners. And thank you for subscribing. If you are whatever channel you're watching this on, there is a little subscription button there. Please feel free to hit that subscription button. And if you have any thoughts or comments, go to our website, theconsciouscapitalists.com, and please leave us a message. And don't forget, if you want to know more about conscious capitalism, um, do go to consciouscapitalism.org. There is a plethora of different sources and information that will help you understand conscious capitalism a little bit better. And don't forget to think about going out and getting the book that Ed didn't mention, but he should have, The Power of And, Responsible Businesses Without Trade-Offs. Thanks again, Ed.